are doing our career series. And I know we have been absent for a while. We've been doing a lot of projects. We actually had an update to our office, which is fabulous. So Nias's room now is, is looking great. And again, if people want to utilize our services for this particular room, I encourage you to, uh, to come and see if your business needs a green room. But I have with me a special guest who uh, works traditionally and uses his degree, because you know I asked that question. But I really want him to just briefly talk about that. What I want him to do is to actually talk about your special project, because you're back in the area and you have a, a, a one a, a new project that's resonating with me and it resonates with a lot of my students. So please introduce yourself. Well, I'm Shane Lewis. Um, We've, I was born here, raised here, uh, for the most part, moved around quite a bit, but mm -hmm. uh, about 14 years ago or so, my wife and I and kids, we moved away and uh, ended up landing in Pennsylvania about three years ago and then came back here. Um, back in, well, I've been here since May, but my family came in August. And I've been working for Saltzer Health, which uh, their main campus is out in Nampa. And I do uh, project management, um, electronic medical record software, training, technical support. And that department is part of what's called the continuous improvement department, which is organizational change. So you have your bachelor's and then you, you earned a master's in what? In organizational leadership from George Fox University. And you actually are using it for that job. Right. Organizational leadership, uh, for those that don't know, is basically business psychology. Mm -hmm. And um, continuous improvement or change management is all about how to lead, guide groups, people, organizations through the change process. And um, you, can, you can break that all the way down to individuals on a personal, private level mm -hmm. and use the same psychology. I, yeah, I agree. So you have an unusual story, an unusual history. So when you were a teenager and I and working in the school counseling arena, public school for half of my professional life and um, my own private individualized school counseling program that I run now, I'm now called an independent educational consultant. But you would have been one of the students that I probably would have gotten a red flag about. And not in a negative way, but that you had some challenges. You, you moved around a lot. There was some um, history of abuse and uh, it's challenging. So how did you make it through school and why now do you want to be kind of a mentor and leader or inspiring kids of this age. So, you know, without revealing all the gory details, but tell us about your new project <laughs> and why, what has inspired you to do this? And, and what are you doing? What is, what well, are you doing? That, that's a fantastic question. And it has multi-levels in terms of answers. Okay. Um, give a brief synopsis. Um, yeah, my mom married five times before I graduated from high school. I moved 20 times. I went to 11 different schools, six different high schools, three high schools my senior year. Mm -hmm. I have a full sibling who's two years older than me, and she has cerebral palsy. She's handicapped. Okay. Or special needs, as today would call it. Back then, it was handicapped. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom's second husband adopted my sister and I because okay. my biological father, after I got to meet him, and lived with him for a couple of years as a teenager, told me that he gave us up for adoption because he didn't want to, one, pay for child support, or two, have a handicapped daughter. But my mom's second husband um, was convicted of molesting her and uh, nine others. My mom's third and fourth husband, same guy, was an alcoholic, and um, their bedroom used to be below mine in the basement. And mm -hmm. so all of the fights, all of the hits, all of the slaps, all of the throwing of things, you the heard. yelling, the screaming, I heard. Mm -hmm. And um, I got scared first and got angry second. 
And then uh, I think I told you already, when I was 14, I got big enough, um, not adult big, but big enough that I beat him in an arm wrestle one night and um, stared him down. Mm -hmm. I didn't say a word. I just stared at him after I beat him. And then two weeks later, I told my mom um, during one of their fights, one of their um, intermissions in their fights, that uh, if he touched her again, I'd kill him. Yeah, and that is a big challenge, and believe it or not, every year I uh, come across, uh, even outside of public school, where it's a challenge like this. And so when um, there are snarky comments on social media, even on LinkedIn, I think there was one comment that came out. There was a poem that a student wrote about not having a pencil, and it was actually really interesting and good. I, I really liked it. And it, it, it basically, and it was not an excuse, but it's no place to do homework, no quiet time, no school supplies, and things like that. And, and he created this poem, which was, was quite profound. And immediately people are like, oh, yeah, well, wine, wine, wine. And I'm thinking you have no idea what it's like for a student who may or may not have even eaten over the weekend, which I'm sure you experienced. Um, I have contacted uh, friends that I, or folks that I knew, we can't necessarily call them friends, but uh, bumped into them, the ones that uh, I'd been to one of the elementary schools in. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, you're that boy that always asked for the roll during lunch. Are you yeah. going to eat that? Are you going to eat that? Because mm -hmm. um, you'd save it and bring it home. I'd, no, I'd eat it. Yeah. <laughs> right then, well, I was but starving. I, and I had a lot of students who I, I knew when they, they were agitated or they may have been just upset in class and caused a problem. The first thing I did is say, when's the last time you ate? And I right. was always quite surprised. And they were always really honest, and I was quite surprised. So we, uh, as you can see, there's food around right. this area. But um, I always had a drawer for that reason because it is challenging. So how did you, how were you able to graduate and get through all this? I have never doubted that my mother loved me. Mm -hmm. um, she always told us. She was always willing to give us hugs. She was very demonstrative in those ways. Mm -hmm. um, she had obviously some challenges with the decisions that she made and allowed us to suffer through yeah. because of those choices. And as I've become a parent, I've had to deal more with it now as a parent than I did as a kid because I didn't know any better back mm -hmm. then. Um, but she always focused on grades. Okay. Right? Um, when I was living with her, it was at grades, grades, grades. Um, we may have been completely dysfunctional in a thousand other ways, but it was always grades. My senior year, um, I paid rent, small token rent, bought my own food had my own car, bought my own insurance. Mm -hmm. And for the, my second semester, I can remember often paying some of my mom's bills in the house that they were at. And um, working 40 hours a week, going to school full time, yeah. I still graduated with a 3.7 that year. So college kind of helped you to move into a future. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I've told my wife this. Um, she was raised in a very religious home, mm -hmm. same parents. Matter of fact, her parents this year are celebrating 50 years of marriage. Um, she has moved more with me than she ever did as a kid. <laughs> and uh, it's really interesting. There was a point in my late 20s, early 30s, where I didn't quite know where to land because I bought my first home with my wife when I was 22. Mm -hmm. I didn't graduate with my master's degree until I was 30, but I had already started my own business doing pest control. And my son, who was our third child, was born two months before I graduated with my master's degree. And once I graduated, I'd had a home, I had a family, I'd been married for over 10 years, longer than my mom had ever been married. Yeah. What next? Yeah. I mean, because as a kid, it was... I didn't even dream about even going to college or owning a home. Well, and I find that a lot of students who are in that situation, similar to what you experienced, 
They may get to college, but it's really challenging to even share a room with a student because their lives, they weren't children. They were parentified. Correct. So it's hard for you then to share a room with, say, two or three people who might be really great people. They didn't have your experience, probably like your own children, where you, they don't, they're not parentified. So therefore, they, they are able to share a room and just be okay. Whereas a student who has had to be a parent and is, has had to be concerned with every dime, every penny, you know, college, getting to college is a privilege. Staying at college is a worry. Can I actually study and continue to work as many hours as I'm, I need to? Those kinds of things, they don't generally do well with roommates. It's interesting. I, if I may switch over to maybe a religious bend just a little bit, I converted to the LDS faith my senior year of high school Mm -hmm. and after 14 months went on a mission. Oh, that probably really helped. That made a huge difference, but I had some moments with what they call companions, the person you're paired up with for a Mm -hmm. certain period of time, where I was very, very rigid. Yeah. Um, Hard on people. I was very hard on people. It's Uh like, you have no idea what you're talking about. This isn't life. I'll show you life. Mm -hmm. Get up. 6.30 6.30 is not that big of a deal, or whatever it was, right? Right. And um, then I got came home, and after seven months being home, I married my wife. And like I said, she grew up in a very stable, very religious home, and for the first two and a half, three years, we had some... We had some working things out that we had to do because I had baggage. Yeah. I had baggage that I didn't even know I had. Right. Right. And that took years to go through. But mm-hmm. our first major fight, believe this or not, Rebecca, was over how to properly cut a green pepper. I, yeah, because <laughs> you needed order and you created your order in order to survive. And it, you cannot let that go until you really, really feel that you're in a trustworthy home, even if it's your own. So, yeah, you've got to read that book, The uh, Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. You will love that book. But I, let's I talk about your project. So, yes, you're going to maintain your work because you still have your family to feed. Correct. And so tell us about what is this new project? Because I think a lot of schools and I think a lot of people will be interested in kind of this inspirational speaking that you want to do. Well, while I was going through my graduate school, Mm -hmm. um, I had dreamed about being a consultant, but not in the consultant in the terms of going into a business and finishing business-based projects but being some sort of a consultant or public speaker, like a uh, Les Brown type mentality. Mm -hmm. I love him. I love him too. (laughs) (laughs) He's one of my favorites. Especially when you go back to his old ones, how he started in the radio station that he talks about. That's funny. Yeah. Les Brown, uh, that mentality, that sort of thought process. Mm -hmm. But then I got to thinking about it. Well, there's so many Tony Robbinses out there nowadays doing their own sort of business-based motivation. Where could I make the largest impact and still feel that fire within for myself that drives me to do what I want to do? And I got to thinking about my life and what I went through and how it would have been so nice Mm -hmm. to have a long-term or even short-term inspirational moment. Um, Yeah. You know, my research was on, I went to school older. Okay. I was, I went to into the trades for 10 years, had a barber shop, and then I uh, fell into school counseling, it, which requires a master's. So what I say is I fell into going to school, and then I fell in again because I had a really great mentor. And what I, my research is on the at-risk students, but college students. At risk, your first year, mm-hmm. guess who the most successful students are. Didn't matter if they went to public, private. I I had a a thousand students that I was able to tap into at the University of New Hampshire. And it was all about your mentor and someone who talked to you about the future. I thought that was 
I, I was blown away because I assumed that the kids that went to those smaller size schools, especially schools that were private schools, were going to have more success with being mentored. But mentoring had the greatest impact and it could be your neighbor, it could, it's just someone who's talking to you about you can get to that next level no matter what's going on in your life, even if your life is perfect. Because that's right. sometimes challenging, too, because you feel like, ooh, I have to live up to my parents. Or you don't know what you don't know. Or you don't know what you want to do. So with all that said, who is it that you want to get a hold of you? Who, who should be calling you and asking you? Because clearly you have a very dynamic presentation to give, and it's going to speak to a lot of people. And I found some of the kids that I worked with had friends. So... I would have students drag kids into my office wow. and let me know that, hey, this is going on. We don't know how to help this person. So I'm telling you, even if you were going to a regular school crowd, there's going to be at least 20% of those kids that it's going to resonate highly with because it's their personal story. But then you're going to have this whole group of kids who want, kids are very good that way. They want to help people. So who is it you want to get in front of? So high school, maybe upper middle school, and definitely young adult, first couple years of college before they pair off and start their new life, things like that. Your, the mentor comment, uh, I didn't grow up with a father figure, and that has messed with my head for decades. It Not does, just years, just kids. decades. Mm -hmm. But the man who was my father figure was my grandfather on my mother's side. He owned his own business. He was a uh, former drill instructor for the Army. Mm -hmm. um, great big man. Not as big as I am, but strong as an ox. And one of the most kind and loving people you'll ever meet. And I was one of the black sheep. My mom was the black sheep in the family. I was the black sheep of my family, so I was pretty dark by the time I hit my yeah, teenage yeah, years. Yeah. Um, my grandfather was that, and then the man I met um, that got me involved with my faith. Sorry. Yeah. He, he drove me down to the MTC, the training center in Provo, mm -hmm. eight, nine months after I'd broken up with his daughter. And it wasn't a, or he, yeah. hey, let me rephrase, yeah. his daughter broke up with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> that is a public announcement, just in case you didn't hear that. Okay. <laughs> so after we were no longer a thing, his dad, her dad continued to mentor. That's great. And he told me one night, when we were driving down, he told me that one night he had made the decision, he had prayed about it, he had done some me uh, meditating, things like that, and he had decided that he was going to forbid his daughter to ever see me again. I was that kind of scary kid. Yeah, well, you yeah, you and, probably needed some away time. Yeah. And, and, and just that growing. I did. I mean, you find your faith, which is very exciting when that happens, but then you get into, okay, how am I going to undo a lot of patterns that I had to develop? Oh, I had to deal with that on my mission. Mm -hmm. But so when I was dating his daughter, he was like, no, you can't see him anymore. At least that's the decision he made. Mm -hmm. And he prayed about it to kind of verify his decision, if you will, for those of you that are familiar with the faith process. Yeah. And he felt that he was shown what would happen to his daughter if he did that. And he told me when he was driving me down, he said, that was the night I decided to open my doors and love you like a son. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward 30 years. It's been plus th almost 30 years since that happened. We moved back to from Pennsylvania. My first Sunday into church, I walk in and there he is. <laughs> and we great. now go to church together. I live within a quarter of a mile from his house. Yeah. My grandfather and Larry are the two strongest male mentors I've had while growing up. And between the two, I quote in my mind so many times different things that they've told me mm -hmm. um, and say things to my kids that yeah. they told me. Right. 
um, I want to be not so that I can do this. I have a deep desire to help because I know the pain. Well, and I think it's important for students to see that it's a tough journey. We all have hard journeys. Everybody has a story. Everybody does. Everybody has a story. But when you've been really challenged, a lot of people don't get challenged until they're in their 40s. I feel more sorry for them. Because if you have been challenged as a teenager and you can grow out of it, it is just powerful. And for them to see that, oh, okay, this is what he's saying. I can relate to it. He made it out. Here are some of the pieces he did. So maybe I can do it too. Breaking the cycle is not mm -hmm. easy. And when you're talking to kids, and, and, and I feel like that's one of the reasons why my business has the success it does is because I did not understand the college process. My parents were blue collar. I, I missed several opportunities to have some really good Oper I just I wouldn't have had the student loan I ended up with <laughs> had I known what I was doing, and I didn't. And and just those pieces, I that alone created a nightmare as far as the loan I ended up with. And you too. Yeah, I've got a loan about the size of a so, really nice truck. <laughs> so people believe me when I talk about you know this is how it's done, and it is my absolute passion to help kids in the, for that reason. But. I definitely, you know, kids, I do a lot with college success coaching. I would strongly suggest that colleges, people who have, um, who are part of a fraternity or sorority, those are great targets for you. I would really encourage people to forward this little clip to people like and share it. And, and if you have any need, that would be great because you're pretty available, right? I How do they get a hold of you? Well, um, right now... The LinkedIn site is SDL Motivations. So that is it's probably going to change. SDL Motivations <laughs> on LinkedIn. You can find him. That's the easiest way to find him. Or you can find my personal profile on LinkedIn as Shane D. Mm -hmm. Lewis. Um, and Shane is S H A Y N E. Okay, yeah, I did notice that that was a little different. You can thank my mom for that one. Yeah, so that's good. It, it sets you apart. It does. It sets you apart. So is there any other thing you want to say um, as well as, again, give your information, but is there any other thing? Just that it has been a passion of mine to help for a long time, and I'm at a point now in my life where I'm more grounded than I ever have been. Mm -hmm. My... I only have one kid left in the house. That's a good feeling. Well, yeah. <laughs> good and bad. Um, <laughs> and he's almost done. He's a sophomore, um, and it's almost, you know, it'll be summertime here soon. And um, I just want to help. Yeah. Um, the pain that I went through, and I know my story is not nearly as deep or dark or negative as some. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard some that, you know, just this weekend, the guy... Uh, story about it. His dad was a major alcoholic and had some problems and would pick him up and literally throw him into walls when he was a kid. Yeah. Um, I didn't experience that myself. I was a little too big. The guy was a little bit more afraid of me, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I consider a, a blessing. Yeah. But I know there are many out there that don't have that um, yeah. protection. And I know enough between personal experience and the psychology and the dragging myself by my bootstraps for decades through it. Um, and the desire. I mean, you're back in your area, which has some really strong, good memories true. for you. So that is always a great place to start. So I really encourage anybody, this is part of our career series, even though he is a successful career man, we also, the big thing is how... Um, how do we get him out to people who need it? And this is a way to do it. So you need to go to LinkedIn, find him on LinkedIn, Shane, S-H-A-Y-N-E, Lewis. Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. So uh, please message him. That's how we ended up connecting and just getting back and forth to each other. And we knew that our services fit like a glove. So you're probably going to hear more from Shane. And um, But again, 
please get a hold of him and any other words of wisdom? Just thank you. Um, I know life can be difficult for anybody, everybody. Um, I don't care what, if you uh, prescribe to a faith or not. Just about any walk of life, if you uh, prescribe to a higher power of believing, if you look at the writings everywhere, it tells you um, life is difficult. And uh, there are ways to get through it, and you definitely don't have to do it alone, which when I was a kid, I thought I had to. And it uh, put a giant chip on my shoulder that um, in many cases is still there. <laughs> so I'm Rebecca M. Carroll. This is part of the College Lightbulb Career Series. Thank you, Shane. And Thank you for having me. We will see you next week.